This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Be one of the first 200 people to sign up at the link below to get 20% off your annual premium subscription. Take a second and imagine the burners on a stovetop. The flames that dance on those burners are created by a supply of gas. And using that gas, you can crank one burner up to full, routing all the gas to it and creating a single bright flame. Or you can choose to distribute that gas, allowing a smaller amount to go to each burner. This is how I think about the concept of work-life balance. Each of us has a certain amount of gas, our time, our energy, our motivation, and whether due to our daily choices or to our obligations, that gas is distributed to four different burners. Let's call them work, health, relationships, and hobbies. And if you're anything like me, then the way that your burners are set right now probably isn't exactly how you really want them. Maybe the work burner is burning just a bit too hot at the moment, or maybe your health burner is totally off right now. You haven't had time to work out or your sleep schedule's a lot of whack. Whatever the cause of that imbalance may be, I believe that there are some habits that you can adopt that will help to start curing it. And today I wanna share three of them. Now, my original script for this video actually listed five habits, with two of them being ones that you might expect. Number one, creating separation between your workspace and the area where you relax. And number two, putting yourself on a schedule, going through a morning routine, getting actually dressed before you start work in the morning, and having a set end time to your workday. In truth, these are both just specific examples of another habit, which is the creation of obligations. See, when you wanna do something in a balanced way, it's a good idea to get in the habit of setting up an obligation that encourages that balance. So for example, I use a combination of two different obligations for my videos. See, I wanna strike a balance between publishing videos on a regular basis, but also pushing my editing and my production skills with each new video that I make. So I create deadlines for my videos, but I also push myself to improve at least one aspect with each video that I create. It could be the way that I speak, it could be the lighting, could be anything, but whatever it is, I write it down in my 1% rule log over on my website. And the combination of the deadlines and this log ensures that I'm never resting on my laurels, just making content that isn't pushing my skills but also that I'm not letting my perfectionism cause me to just never publish. And I've learned from experience that trying to rely solely on self-discipline to strike this balance simply does not work nearly as well. As James Clear puts it in his book, Atomic Habits, you do not rise to the level of your goals, you fall to the level of your systems. And obligations are simply components of a system that pushes you to live with the type of balance you aspire to. So here's an example of an obligation for each of our four burners. And hopefully these examples will help you think of your own obligations that'll help you strike the type of balance that you want. Now for the work burner, I've already mentioned the deadlines that drive me to finish and publish my work on a schedule. So here I'll just briefly mention that I also use a tool called Beeminder that will literally charge me money if I don't upload on time. Now that may sound a bit extreme for some of you, but as a notorious perfectionist, extreme measures are very helpful to me, so I use them. For health, easily the most helpful obligations that I have are the ones imposed on me by my coach. Whenever it's a lifting day, I'm given a specific workout to do and I have to upload videos proving that I did it. But on the lighter side, I also share my activity data with a couple of my friends, which allows each of us to see whether the others closed their exercise and their movement rings for the day. Now for your relationships, I think that you should schedule plans with friends in advance, especially right now when we can't go to our typical physical gathering places and hence we're kind of at home just doing doing our own thing for most of the day. And weekly game night with friends is a great way to do this. And there are a ton of games that you can play remotely, including Jackbox games, which are some of my favorites. Don't Starve is a great multiplayer option and even good old chess.com. Finally, you have your hobbies, which could be creative and productive like making music or just totally relaxing like playing video games. Now obligations can be a bit of a double-edged sword when it comes to hobbies because they can often turn those hobbies into work. So my suggestion would be to apply strategic obligations to the other three burners first. And in most cases, you'll find that you're probably gonna have space carved out for those hobbies naturally. But you can also schedule time for them as well, just as you schedule time with your friends. Now, even with well-structured obligations, I sometimes find that my work-life balance starts to tip way too far into the work territory. And when my work burner starts to burn too brightly, I've noticed that it's often a result of me feeling a sort of pressure to be successful as quickly as possible. And if you feel the same pressure, it's worth asking yourself this question. Why 
are you in a hurry? Or what exactly is causing you to feel the need to compress your timetable for success? In other words, it's useful to identify the external sources of pressure that push you to work harder. Now, sometimes these are legitimate, like the deadlines imposed by a degree program or trying to get out of debt. But I've noticed that a lot of the pressure sources in my own life aren't actually legitimate and ultimately they're just negative. Sometimes it's jealousy. Sometimes I'll see one of my friends or my peers do something really cool and then I'll get this temporary feeling of inadequacy, which makes me feel like I have to push to keep up. Or other times it's FOMO, the fear of missing out. The screens in your pocket and on your desk show you so many different potential paths that you could go down and they feed you this potent combination. The highlight reels inspire you, the profiles of your peers put pressure on you to keep up, the endless tutorials can teach you anything, and the tools are often cheap or free and are just a click away. So the message is clear, you can do anything. And since you can do anything, it actually feels like you're losing something when you pass up an opportunity. Finally, there's the incessant pressure to keep the metrics that measure your success going up. It's very easy to start to peg your sense of self-worth and satisfaction to some kind of external metric, be it money or followers or likes or whatever it is. And you don't wanna just see this metric continue to go up, you wanna see that change happen faster and faster over time. I have a term for this, I call it acceleration addiction. Over time, the same increases don't feel as meaningful as they used to because our brains lack the ability to disregard our point of reference. A $1,000 raise seems huge when you're making $20,000 a year, but not when you're making six figures. A 10% increase in followers seems great one month, but then the next month, you'll be looking out for an even bigger change. Your acceleration addiction causes you to constantly move the goalposts that define enough. So you have to train your mind to find meaning elsewhere. No amount of success will cause these pressures to ease up if you continue to fixate on them. The jealousy, the FOMO, the acceleration addiction, these will always be there, pressuring you to pump that gas more and more towards the work burner. And on the flip side, there are very few natural sources of pressure that will push you to live a more balanced life and to do the things that truly make you happy, which means that you have to create those pressures for yourself. And one great way to do this is to simply list out the things that really do make you happy. I did this myself recently and I came up with a list of seven items, which includes things like doing work that challenges and pushes my creative abilities and forces me to learn new things. It also includes spending time outside, especially when I'm moving in quick, complex ways. And I think this is why I enjoy skating so much. Now, going for a walk outside is nice, but there is nothing like the rush of gracefully flying down the pavement, carving around corners and leaping over obstacles. And there's also music, time spent with people that I care about, and being physically fit. These are the things that I truly care about, that make me truly happy. So I'd recommend taking some time and creating a list like this for yourself, and then maybe posting it in a place where you'll see it often. Get in the habit of looking at it and reminding yourself that the items on that list are what truly make you happy, not the pursuit of some external measure of success. Now, to a certain degree, living a balanced life means sacrificing the potential to become truly great at one thing, or at least to do so quickly. People who are truly great at their crafts, especially those who become great early on, typically do so by turning down the heat on the other burners in their life. Their craft becomes their singular priority, dominating their time. And if you wanna become great at your own craft as well, you'll likely have to start moving in the same direction. But it doesn't mean that you can't be strategic about it. Yes, an incredibly ambitious goal might require you to cut time spent on relationships or exercise, or especially hobbies, but there are probably other things that you could cut first. So look at how you spend your time and then try to identify the low value activities. Time spent mindlessly scrolling through social media or binging shows that you don't actually care about should be the first things to go. In fact, if you wanna think back to our stove metaphor, the time spent on these activities doesn't really fit onto any of the burners. It's more like poking a hole in the gas line with a nail. And by reducing the time you spend on these things, you gain time for your goals without making cuts to relationships, your health, or even your hobbies. But if making cuts in those areas isn't enough, there is yet another way to preserve the time you spend in these areas while still accomplishing more. When you're working, work intensely. 
Move quickly. Don't let a moment go to waste. Now this seems obvious, but a lot of people don't really use it. And you have to understand that the value of time isn't determined solely by the amount of time itself, but also by the intensity and the strategic value of the effort that you exert during it. So do whatever you have to do to remove any lethargy from your work time. Move with purpose and move with a plan. Do your best to figure out the best course of action and the best order of operations. Of course, one other way you'll be able to accomplish a lot more during your work time is by improving your ability to solve problems. Because when you can more effectively pull information from lots of disparate sources and combine ideas in your mind, you'll break through barriers in your work a lot more quickly. And a great resource for building those problem solving skills is Brilliant. Brilliant is a learning library of courses in math, science, and computer science that all focus on active learning and active problem solving. Their courses quickly throw you into bite-sized challenges that are logically sequenced, so you're immediately applying the concepts, solving problems, and learning more quickly. All the while, you're also getting universal problem solving practice, which you'll be able to apply to your work. Okay, while well, I agree with them, we can check if, uh, if at least one has a bigger value than that. If so, swap it then set i to i minus one. Now, Brilliant's library includes more than 60 full-length courses, with a full math suite ranging from the fundamentals to calculus and probability, science courses covering light, gravity, and relativity, and computer science courses that start with the basics of algorithms and get all the way into quantum computing. So if you wanna start expanding your knowledge, if you wanna start building your problem solving skills, then head over to brilliant.org slash Thomas Frank and sign up. And if you're one of the first 200 people to use that link, you'll even get 20% off your annual premium subscription. So thank you so much for watching. Hopefully you found this video helpful. Hopefully there was something you can apply to your life and start getting your life a little bit more balanced going forward. And if you did like this video, definitely hit that like button to show the YouTube algorithm what's up. You can also get subscribed right over here if you haven't done so already, or check out a couple of other videos on this channel right over here on this side of the screen. As always, smashing your face into your phone screen is a more effective way of clicking those links than using your thumbs or even your fingers. I think the nose was just evolved for hitting links on a phone screen. So definitely do that or don't because as always, I'm not your dad.